Hi, my name is Laura, and welcome to my audio version of the Pediatrics Endocrinology EOR Study Guide. The rest of the pediatrics topics can be found on my channel, but I'll link them below as well. This review is going to follow the PAEA Endocrinology portion of the Pediatrics End of Rotation Exam Topic List, and I'll timestamp all the topics below in case you'd like to skip around. The first topic is diabetes mellitus. Insulin-dependent diabetes is the most common endocrine disease in childhood, and family history is the main risk factor. In general, diabetes mellitus is a condition where the body has trouble moving glucose from the blood into the cells. The body normally regulates how much glucose is in the blood relative to the cells using two hormones, insulin and glucagon. Both of these hormones are produced in the pancreas by the islets of Langerhans. Insulin is secreted by beta cells there, and glucagon is secreted by the alpha cells. Insulin reduces blood glucose levels by binding to insulin receptors in the cell membranes of insulin-responsive tissues in the body. Activation of these insulin receptors causes glucose transporter to fuse with the cell membrane, which allows glucose to move into the cell. More glucose into the cells means less glucose in the blood, and lower blood glucose. Insulin also works in the liver to directly inhibit gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, reducing hepatic glucose production. Now glucagon is the opposite. Glucagon increases blood glucose levels because it stimulates gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis in the liver. It promotes the breakdown of glycogen stores in the liver into more glucose, which gets released into the blood. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cells. This inappropriate autoimmune response is associated with two susceptibility genes called HLA-DR3 and HLA-DR4. So fewer pancreatic beta cells means less insulin, and that means glucose starts to build up in the blood. This is a type 4 or cell-mediated hypersensitivity response, by the way. It most commonly presents in children or young adults, and symptoms include polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria, glycosuria, and weight loss. The glycosuria occurs because there is so much glucose in the blood that when it gets filtered through the kidneys, some spills into the urine. And glucose is osmotically active, similar to salt. Just like water follows salt, well, water follows sugar, too. This is what causes the polyuria, and so much urination leads to dehydration, causing the polydipsia, or excessive thirst. Another thing that can happen in type 1 diabetes is diabetic ketoacidosis, also referred to as DKA. This results from a combination of hyperglycemia, dehydration, ketonemia with high anion gap metabolic acidosis, and potassium deficiency. The child will appear acutely ill with significant dehydration, polyuria, polydipsia, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And they might also have a fruity or acetone-like breath odor due to the ketones. DKA is an emergent condition. So let's backtrack to diagnosis of type 1 diabetes in these kids. Diagnosis is made by blood test, by one of the following. A random blood glucose level more than 200 in a kid with diabetic symptoms. A hemoglobin A1c greater than 6.5%. Two separate fasting glucose levels greater than 126. Or a two-hour oral glucose tolerance test greater than 200. Any of these can diagnose diabetes mellitus. Additionally, the blood can also be tested for low insulin, low C-peptide, presence of glutamic acid decarboxylase, or GAD, antibodies, and presence of IA2 antibodies. Treatment of type 1 diabetes is just insulin, since these patients are no longer able to produce their own. The goal here is to keep their A1c below 7.5. 
So there are a few different types of insulin to know about, but we won't go too far into the weeds. Rapid-acting insulins include Lispro and Aspart, and they have an onset of 5 to 15 minutes, so they're given at the same time as a meal. Short-acting insulin is regular insulin. It has an onset of about 30 minutes, so it's given a half hour or an hour prior to meals. Intermediate insulin includes NPH and Lente and covers insulin for about half of a day or overnight, so it's often given at bedtime. Long-acting insulin includes Detamir and Glargine, and it covers insulin for a full day. This is called basal insulin. Basal insulin is often paired with a rapid or short-acting insulin for meals. And also, it's important to mention that long-acting insulins should not be mixed in the same syringe as other types of insulin. There are also pre-mixed combinations of insulin available, but we won't go into that here. Essentially, these kids will get a basal insulin and a rapid or short-acting insulin for meals. And insulin pumps and monitoring devices can be considered for convenience and to help simplify treatment. The next topic is hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism occurs when thyroid hormone levels, specifically T3 and T4, are elevated. This increases metabolism, causing symptoms like heat intolerance due to increased heat production, weight loss but with increased appetite, anxiety, tremors, sweating, insomnia, fatigue, diarrhea, tachycardia, other symptoms of increased sympathetic activity, and changes in behavior and school performance. So normally the hypothalamus detects low levels of thyroid hormone in the blood and secretes thyrotropin-releasing hormone, which causes the pituitary to secrete thyroid-stimulating hormone, or TSH, which is also called thyrotropin. And this causes the thyroid gland to secrete T3 and T4 thyroid hormones. In hyperthyroidism, there's an excess of these hormones. If the problem is with the thyroid itself, it's called primary hyperthyroidism. And if the pituitary is the problem, then it's secondary hyperthyroidism. The most common etiology in children is Graves' disease, which is a primary hyperthyroidism. Also, neonatal Graves' disease occurs in about 2% of infants born to women with Graves' disease due to the passage of the TSH receptor-stimulating antibody across the placenta, but these cases resolve within a few months. So Graves' disease is an autoimmune disease that occurs when B cells produce antibodies against TSH receptors on follicular cells of the thyroid. These TSH receptor antibodies are also called antithyrotropin antibodies, and they bind to the TSH receptors and activate them. This causes an increase in thyroid hormone synthesis and thyroid gland growth. Graves' disease presents with the regular symptoms of hyperthyroidism plus a diffuse enlarged thyroid and thyroid bruise. In adults, it can present with exophthalmos, but this isn't that common in children. Pretibial myxedema is another possible symptom. If a diagnosis of hyperthyroidism is suspected, order a TSH, free T4, and T3 labs. You can also order thyroid autoantibodies, those antithyrotropin antibodies. Um, Graves' disease will show high T3 and T4 levels and a low TSH, since all of those thyroid hormones are providing negative feedback to the pituitary. Treatment of hyperthyroidism in children can include thioamide medication or radioiodine ablation. Because Graves' disease can have spontaneous remission in children, medications are often used first. Thioamide medications include propothiouracil, PTU, and methimazole. These drugs work by inhibiting thyroid peroxidase, which blocks the synthesis of T3 and T4 in the thyroid. Propothiouracil, or PTU, has an additional mechanism of action in which it blocks the conversion of T4 into T3 in the peripheral tissues, but it also has more side effects. Some side effects to be aware of for both PTU and methimazole are hypothyroidism, lupus-like syndrome, and agranulocytosis. Also, PTU is hepatotoxic, so methimazole is the preferred medication. 
In cases where radioiodine ablation therapy is used, radioactive iodine is given orally and taken up by the thyroid, causing permanent damage to the thyroid. This is a definitive treatment for Graves' disease, but patients often end up needing thyroid hormone replacement therapy afterwards for hypothyroidism. So just remember that methimazole is the preferred treatment in kids. And in neonatal Graves' disease, symptoms can be controlled with propanolol and methimazole. Now that we've covered hyperthyroidism, let's move on to hypothyroidism, which occurs when there is a deficit of thyroid hormone. The most common cause of hypothyroidism in pediatrics is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. There's also a congenital form of hypothyroidism called cretinism, which presents with macroglossia, hoarse cry, coarse facial features, and is one of the leading causes of intellectual disability in the world. But we're going to focus on Hashimoto's in this section. Hashimoto's disease occurs when the immune system produces anti-thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Thyroid peroxidase plays a critical role in T3 and T4 synthesis, so inhibiting it decreases production of thyroid hormones. Hypothyroidism is divided into primary and secondary. Remember, primary is when the problem is in the thyroid gland, so Hashimoto's thyroiditis is a primary hypothyroidism. Symptoms of hypothyroidism are basically the opposite of those for hyperthyroidism, so cold intolerance, fatigue, constipation, weight gain, bradycardia, and depression. Diagnosis begins with thyroid labs, including TSH, T3, and T4. In Hashimoto's, T3 and T4 will be low, and TSH will be high because there's not enough thyroid hormone to provide negative feedback to the pituitary. You can also order antithyroid peroxidase antibody and antithyroglobulin antibody labs. These will be positive in Hashimoto's, as well as a few other autoimmune hypothyroid conditions. First-line treatment is levothyroxine, which is synthetic T4. We're basically just replacing the thyroid hormone that the patient can't produce themselves and TSH levels need to be monitored frequently in these patients. The next topic is hypercalcemia, which is excess calcium in the blood. Most cases are due to primary hyperparathyroidism, where the parathyroid gland is secreting excess parathyroid hormone, or PTH. PTH causes the bones to release calcium, the intestine to absorb more calcium, and the kidneys to reabsorb more calcium, so serum calcium levels increase. Another cause of hypercalcemia is malignancy, which can secrete PTH-related protein that works similarly to PTH. And other causes include vitamin D excess, vitamin A excess, and certain medications like thiazides and lithium. Most patients are asymptomatic, but when they do have symptoms, the mnemonic to remember for hypercalcemia is stones, bones, groans, and psychiatric overtones. So symptoms include increased risk for kidney stones, abnormal bone remodeling and fracture risk, abdominal cramping, nausea, and constipation, and psychiatric symptoms like lethargy, depressed mood, and cognitive dysfunction. Hypercalcemia also increases the excitation threshold for the heart, nerves, and muscle cells, so a stronger stimulus is needed for contraction. This can lead to diminished reflexes and arrhythmias like bradycardia, AV block, and shortened QT interval. Diagnosis is made through lab work. The total serum calcium will be high, but a high ionized calcium will be most accurate. In the case of primary hyperparathyroidism, PTH will be high and phosphorus will be low. You can also assess PTH-related peptide, vitamin D levels, and a 24-hour urinary calcium level. Treatment for severe or symptomatic hypercalcemia is IV fluids and furosemide, which is first line. Furosemide is a loop diuretic that increases renal excretion of calcium. Calcitonin and bisphosphonates can also be given. Mild hypercalcemia does not need treatment. 
The next topic is obesity. Childhood obesity has become a growing problem in the U.S., leading to increased risk for heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. BMI calculation, or body mass index, is a practical tool for assessing obesity in children. It's plotted on a growth curve to determine BMI percentile. Normal weight is classified as a BMI between the 5th and the 85th percentile for age and sex. 85th to 95th percentile is overweight, and over the 95th percentile is obese. In children that fall into these higher percentiles, consider assessing lipids, A1C and fasting glucose, and ALT to check for fatty liver disease. Patient and parent education is important, like dietary and exercise recommendations, and limiting sugar to less than 25 grams per day. A referral to a pediatric obesity specialist can also be considered. The last topic is short stature, which is a common concern that can either be normal or pathologic. Normal causes include genetics, meaning that they come from a family with short stature, and constitutional delay. Constitutional delay means they grow and develop normally, but just follow along at or below the 5th percentile. Puberty is delayed, so there's a delay in bone age as well. Pathologic causes of short stature include rickets due to vitamin D deficiency, achondroplasia, which is dwarfism, prenatal etiologies like placental dysfunction or infections, and postnatal causes like malnutrition, chronic disease, endocrine disorders, drugs, etc. Diagnostic testing is usually not necessary because most short stature results from familial short stature or constitutional delay. But if you're uncertain, bone age can be assessed by x-ray of the left wrist, which can differentiate between familial short stature, constitutional delay, and precocious puberty. Other labs to consider include a thyroid panel, renal function tests, CBC, albumin and total protein, IGF-1 to look for growth hormone deficiency, karyotyping, and MRI of the head. And that wraps up the endocrinology portion of the Pediatrics EOR Exam Study Guide. Thanks for sticking with me on this one, especially since I'm getting over a cold at the moment. If you're listening to these videos in order, the next section is hematology, which I'll link below once it's up. If you're listening as these videos roll out, there's a whole lot of EOR content getting uploaded at once, so stay tuned, subscribe to the channel, and thank you so much for listening. Happy studying, and I'll see you in the next video!